The Sondheim musical Sunday in the Park with George concerns the life of the artist George Surratt and his great grandson, also named George, also an artist. In one song, the muse of the artist reflects back to George the impact he had on her. She sings that he taught her how to see, how to notice every tree, every shade and color, the light and the life. It's a strange experience to walk out into the world after spending a couple of hours in an art gallery. There's a process of adjustment where one's eyes having been fed by the dazzling array of color and line, reacquaint themselves with the world as it appears. However, one doesn't settle back into the exact same way of seeing as before entering the gallery. New shades of green are noticed in every tree, new details on the landscape or in the face of your companion. New wonder at the detail and diversity of the crowd shuffling by. One has been taught how to see, often without realizing it. Taught how to look at the world and take notice of its beauty and wonder, its color and light, its shade and darkness. It also teaches us to see the gaps, to be struck and disturbed by the way, fall the, way the world falls short of the artist's vision, to notice the absence of trees where development has triumphed, to notice the sorrow in faces struggling to make connection, to notice the lack of awe in all of us who toil and struggle in an exacting world. Today on Love Wins Repeat, we explore one of the great artistic traditions of the church, the Stations of the Cross, their power, poignancy, and purpose. How might they teach us to see anew the passion of our Lord and the suffering of our neighbours? To guide us on this journey, I am joined by two guests. Margaret Adams Parker, a professional artist and theological educator, deeply committed to the visual arts as a means of biblical interpretation and aid to prayer. And Catherine Sonderegger, William Mead Professor of Theology at Virginia Theological Seminary. The first volume of her systematics, The Doctrine of God, was released in 2015, and volume two on the Doctrine of the Holy Trinity will be released in 2020. Today, we are talking about their recently released collaboration, Praying the Stations of the Cross, Finding Hope in a Weary Land, released by Erdman's this year, 2019. Please welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, Catherine Sonderegger and Margaret Adams Parker, Kate and Peggy. Well, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, everyone, and a special welcome to my two guests today, Margaret Adams Parker and Catherine Sonderegger, or Peggy and Kate, as they introduce themselves to me. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. So we're talking about your new book out now, which is Praying the Stations of the Cross, Finding Hope in a Weary Land, out with Erdman's. Uh, let's just start with the broad question. What got you interested enough in the Stations of the Cross to write this book, to, to prepare these artworks? Where did that uh, interest uh, come from? Shall I do that? I think you should start since you were the originator of the whole. I, um, as I explain in the artist afterwards, I, I don't think I'd even heard of the Stations of the Cross. Certainly I had never prayed them till I got to my current parish and I was in my forties and I found them enormously moving conceptually, the words, visually, they were, they were invisible almost because the stations were this big and they were far away from where we were standing and no one ever looked up to see them except to make sure they were in the right place. So you look up to say, oh yes, we were at station five and then we would look down at a little book and we'd follow. And you know, I'm a working artist. I thought, could it not be possible to make a set of stations where the image would carry the power of that journey to the cross? And I'm a printmaker as well as a sculptor. And I'm particularly interested in how the body tells the story. And, and people also tell me about my work that it draws them into a narrative. And so I started in 1995 
now a long time ago, um, making charcoal drawings. And then in 1998, I cut the first of the woodcut prints and finished them in 2005, except for one that I redid in 2017. And um, the idea of making a book came because parishes, that I made this for my home parish, and but I have a traveling set that goes around and uh, a loner set. And first Kerm, whoever, whoever, uh, books it, gets it first, and um, it's, so parishes asked me when I come in and talk about the stations, and in preparing for that, I learned about the history of it and questions about it, and um, then um, I, I thought, well, maybe it would be possible to put together a book, and I had done a book with my woodcuts of the book of illustrating the book of Ruth, interpreting the book of Ruth with Ellen Davis. Um, Who are you, my daughter, reading Ruth through image and text. And she did a new con uh, translation with notes. I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do something like this. And um, Kate is my dear friend and colleague and a, a magnificent preacher. And we, we put together this book. So I was honored to be uh, approached and invited by Peggy to participate in this project. I, I think for me, the, the passion of Christ is the centerpiece of the Christian hope and life. And I have always found Peggy's images eloquent on that central mystery. So a, a chance to contribute some of my own preaching and reflection on the Paschal mystery and tying it to this medieval tradition of the stations and the sense of liturgy that accompanies all our days. Uh, that was something that I was eager to be a part of. And I think it's also fair to say, because Kate has grounded each of her volumes, or is grounding, has and is, and will be, grounding each of her systemat volumes of her systematic in an Old Testament te text, an Old Testament book. And, and she can explain this more than I can. And so there is that long tradition of Old Testament text commenting on the, the stations because there are a number of stations that aren't in the passion narrative. Um, and we argue that this is justified and, um, and is, a, is a kind of commentary on the passion narrative in the same way that our Christmas carols are commentaries. You know, the snow is not in the, in the biblical narrative either. Um, and you may not have snow where you are, but... Um, <laughs> so is that, is that fair, Kate? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Well, actually, yeah, there's a, a question there which I thought it, um, you bring up, which I was going to ask is, so the, the, the stations do sometimes come under, uh, I guess, critique sometimes for mm -hmm. um, having these extra biblical scenes. Um, mm -hmm. But you argue that there's a, a virtue in, you know, holding to the, the traditional set, the 14. Um, what, what is that for you? You kind of started to touch on that there, that it's, you know, it, is, adds an additional layer of commentary, but why do you think it's important that if we are going to engage this practice to to use that enlarged set? Mm -hmm. you take that? I, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Um, one, it seems to me that the stations might be favorably compared with Ignatius Loyola's account of how it is we are to enter into scripture and um, students of the exercises will remember that Ignatius has in mind that we place ourselves within it, that it become a tactile scene to us where we imagine the time of day and the, the smell and the feel of the room that we're in. Um, and that colloquy, as he calls it, I think is the kind of thing that the stations in their elaboration invite us to do is it, not only to read the uh, passion narrative and to read it in its canonical 
form, but also to place our own lives, our sorrows and hopes within it. And those scenes pick up on these deep personal and corporate responses to the suffering of the Son of Man. So the way in which uh, Veronica takes her place within the pilgrimage to the cross, or, or the deposition that unites the disciples who had scattered and fled. I, that, I think, is um, consonant with the kind of genius interpretation that Ignatius has in mind. I think, too, it also signals an openness to the Midrashim tradition that uh, we Christians should properly receive from the rabbinic tradition of uh, attempting to fill out and elaborate what we see in the Akedah or, or in the Joseph and Elijah cycles. And the stations are a very natural midrashim on the passion. And, and how can you not have a scene with Jesus's mother holding his body. And if it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gap in the mm. narrative. And... Um, but comments on the Joanine passion. Yes, uh, yeah. Where Mary is at the foot of the cross. Right, right. Mm. Um, but is not seen holding the body. Mm. That's what I mean, that, that there's not that, that exactly. scene. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I want to come back to Mary in a second, but the, before getting there, the, the subtitle is, is Finding Hope in a Weary Land. And you also write early that, you know, while the stations are very much associated with Lent and Easter, really there is no season for the stations of the cross. They can, they can exist, you know, be used and be useful and be meaningful in any time. Uh, maybe talk to us a bit about the, the life and value of the stations uh, in all seasons and maybe in particularly uh, in times such as these? Mm. Mm. Well, it would be, it would be make the life of a pastor much easier if, if Sarah only came during Lent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and, uh, but it doesn't, uh, or only in Holy Week. And I feel great comfort in, in um, knowing that Christ suffered and carries my suffering. And um, I think that's one of the things we, we um, emphasize in the in introductory sections and also in the, there's a service that accompanies each of the stations, that uh, 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 prayers, uh, scripture readings, a contemporary prayer, and then a meditation that I have edited from Kate's sermons and trying to adapt sermons that she preached, uh, not, not on the stations, but to, the, to, the, to particular stations. Um, and do you want to speak more to this? Mm, I, I, you have expressed very well my, my sense that um, the Christian life is putting on the death of Christ. It, it is also being raised up into his resurrection. But it, it is always that dying and rising pattern. And uh, that, um, that centerpiece of the faith, I think, is what we as disciples know most intimately, know in our life what it is like to see that pattern of light and shadow falling across our path. And uh, my, my prayer is that that collection of images and reflections will awaken in the reader a sense that, that this ancient pattern of Israel's exile and return of slavery and release uh, of um, sorrow and then of healing will also tie in with Christ's own 
presence as the one who suffered and lives forevermore and that that is the guide in a world that is filled with a kind of conflict and anger and despair that we see day by day and there is a there is a, a tradition there are ways of praying the station that seem to welcome suffering and take it on and we or i i don't believe that god wants us to suffer and wants us but that when we do suffer god stands beside us and so this the way we are presenting these stations stands apart from that kind of tradition you want to speak a little more to that this is probably one of these places where um, Peggy has more confidence about this than <laughs> I do. I, you know, I, I look at the prophet Jeremiah and mm -hmm. uh, I, I hope that it is the case that, uh, that God does not will or intend suffering directly, but I'm not sure. And uh, some people are broken on God. And I, I think it is rare. It's a rare form of holiness, but I, I think it may be a possible one. Mm -hmm. um, but the aim of the book is not, not to glorify that, um, but I, I think I'm, I'm someone who thinks that the son came to earth to die. And I think he, he was as God, uh, broken on that, mm -hmm. uh, on that path and that obedience. And, um, so I think it may be possible mm -hmm. um, but I I think is mercifully rare Peggy you mentioned before the uh, the way your art often deals with the body and, and, and embodiment and uh, there are several pieces in which the body of Jesus comes into contact with another like you mentioned earlier with his mother um, mm -hmm. or with a group of others as the case, mm -hmm. the case with station 14 um, I felt that that contact in the pieces, particularly between Jesus and his mother, you know, often echo across scenes and, and contain kind of manifolds of meaning in the way the the bodies are interacting and, and, and holding each other. Um, what's it like composing these scenes of contact? And I guess what is it we learn about these moments where Jesus' body is not isolated uh, from others, as is so often probably depicted in his life and in and in the Passion. Right. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for noticing that the two scenes with Mary are echoes of one another, because that was very intentional, that, that Christ cradles, embraces his mother in the same way, um, holding her head in the same way that she cradles his dead body. And that was, but I have rarely had someone notice that. So you have a wonderful eye. Thank you. Um, and one of the things Kate noticed, notes in her meditations is that Christ sometimes is isolated and alone and other times it, and alone even when he's in the midst of crowds and other times he's really among us. And um, I, that that among us and with us and touching us and healing us with a touch is something that's very moving to me. So those scenes um, with the being touched by others um, are very important to me. And I am actually finishing right now a second set of Stations of the Cross. They're a very large paintings and they, they are different in every way. They're contemporary figures rather than historical. Um, 
and they're much more intentionally relational so that when um, uh, Simon of the, the soldier who's nailing Christ is to the cross, they are looking at one another or um, in the same way that the woman wiping the face of Jesus looks at him in those woodcuts. But that's a, that it, it I, I learned about that relationship, I think, in making that first set of stations and then writing the book and then coming back to make this second set. Um, but that, that physical touching, and if you, the, particularly that, um, the nailing in the woodcut and the hand being violated by the nail and Kate's wonderful meditation on touch and how Christ reaches out to touch and that touch is so primary a, a means of communicating. Um, and that when we forbid teachers to hug elementary school children. And you know, there are reasons for all of this, but that it is, it's a very sad development that we are truncating and eliminating that, that sense of touch from our um, ex exchanges with one another. Thank you for that. Uh, Hey, we, there's an interplay, I think, that emerges in, in, and re-emerges in your reflections that by paying attention to Christ's suffering, our eyes may be opened and our hearts expanded to the suffering of the world. Um, but then in the suffering of Christ, we also see something more. We see the triumph of God over evil and death. We see Christ as the one, you write, as the one who stands at the entrance of every grave and says, come out. And I guess I'm wondering is how do... How, that seems like a lot to try to hold together. Uh, you know, we've got to try to resist the urge to move too quickly to glory and joy, um, but also resisting the urge to stay in the overwhelming and all too real suffering of, of the world's crucified people. So I guess how, how do we hold those, those pieces together? Mm, that is a wonderful question and is the heart of the Paschal mystery. It's, um, to actually allow Christ to die. I, I think this is a very difficult thing for us modern Christians to do. Uh, I think on the whole, uh, we think about his crucifixion as a kind of rounding out of his earthly life. And we see it always bathed in the light of Easter morning. Um, but I, I think that the, the passion of Christ it is there as a perfect work, that it, it has a fullness and a redeeming completeness to it that demands that we see it as a whole, as uh, being truly dead, uh, a, a true ending, um, and a great breaking in grief, and that that resonates in all other worldly griefs yeah, and uh, receives an echo of that one loss. Uh, and the rising is this impossible second thing. It's, it's not, I think, a natural conclusion to Christ um, being taken from the cross and buried, uh, but this um, against all expectation victory over his tasting death. And that I think is uh, very much what new life is like for us, what hope is like, that it, it is this um, impossible reality that breaks into a, a world that really, that knows futility and conflict and war and those it takes to be real. Uh, and so the, the outbreaking of peace in heaven and on earth, that's the impossible thing that is more real still, is this victory over it. Um, but it's not 
a natural expectation. So I, I think um, my, my thought is that for us, we, we cannot actually hold together the dying and the rising. Uh, it, is, it is Christ and his unique and sovereign life, his majesty that holds them together. And this is why it is a divine work. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hmm. So we, we've, <laughs> we've touched on Mary a bit earlier and she appears uh, more than once uh, in <clears> the <throat> stations. Uh, but kind of, I think both the art and the written reflections capture the fact that the Mary we find uh, in these stations is not necessarily the Mary we often first think about. So perhaps talk to us a little bit, uh, open to both of you, talk to us a little bit about the Mary we find on the Via Dolorosa and, and maybe what, what disciples uh, can gain from, from seeing, from meeting Mary here. Mm. Well, I joke that I have a Protestant devotion to Mary because <laughs> I have many images of Mary. Mm. Um, and, and I also teach at um, the visual arts as a language of faith at this Virginia Seminary. I'm on the adjunct faculty, so I teach just a little bit. And um, I am urging my students to look for images of real power and not images which are either, uh, so there are images which are used over and over and retain their power. There are images which are not, which are not strong to begin with, and then there are images which, in being used over and over, lose their power. And um, and there are powerful images from ancient times, from medieval times. My personal hero, Rembrandt, um, and contemporary work. Um, but what I'm, Mary, and Kate picks this up particularly in her reflection on the Pietà, in, is, is every woman who suffers. Um, and that she is, th there are reasons that an artist shows Mary as the Queen of Heaven, but those are not reasons that are exploring the narrative. Those are reasons that, it, that and they're, they're beautiful and powerful images, but they're images that are explaining what Mary means to the church or this nature of the sacrament. Or, um, But what I'm interested in is an image which explores the narrative and what it would have been like for this young girl and not the queen of heaven, um, but for a young girl asked to do this impossible thing. And, and how terrifying it would have been, um, how, um, against all nature, um, and how cruel at the end. Um, there are wonderful poems, there are, um, there's wonderful music that explore this, particularly contemporary poems, that say that, um, oh, Mary, um, Ann Porter, um, in, a, in a poem about Mary, she was a Roman Catholic, um, 20th century American poet, married to a painter, actually. And in, in a poem called Cause of Our Joy, she says, mother of a convict, um, wife of a carpenter, mother of a convict, cause of our joy. Um, at the very end of this poem. Um, does that start to answer it a little bit? Yeah, yes, no, thank okay. you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I think um, it um, is parallel and corresponds to a, a, an important question in Christology, to what extent is Christ particular and unique, and to what extent is he universal? and representative. And I think all of the figures who surround Jesus and who become part of the uh, gospel narrative 
uh, share in that twofold dimension of being particular uh, and yet every man and every woman. Yeah. So uh, all of these figures uh, in the College of Disciples um, belong to Second Temple Judaism and, and to a, a particular place within the covenant history of Israel, but they also are the uh, models and exemplars, the types of uh, confession and betrayal and doubt. Uh, and Mary, I think, uh, more strongly even than the College of Disciples, carries this capacity of being this particular young uh, woman and the one who bears these sorrows in her heart. But then it, in that uniqueness carries this ability to be the mother of all the living and uh, to, to bear the world's sorrows in a, a particular and maternal way. And you might be interested that the, um, the sermon that's now the meditation on the Pieta was one that Kate preached at a prayer service at our church for um, what was then South Sudan before it became a, a no it was was it before or after was it the, the I civil think it was war? in the middle of the civil war so I don't think that they had actually declared Sudan and South Sudan distinct mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was in the process of, of that terrible mm -hmm. Unfolding. So there are a number of references to Sudan and the text that you chose was Rachel weeping for her children. So it was easy to then conflate Rachel and Mary. Um, yeah. We have in this area a particular relationship um, with the church, in, the, the church in Sudan, in South Sudan and Sudan. And, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a, a, a yeah that was a particularly moving given that context. So thank you for shaping that, um, Peggy. For, for you, you you talk about uh, there's a story in the book about how you shifted the way you represented Simeon after conversations in a community of believers. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about so when working on art in in an ecclesial setting, as I, as I know you do, what is the mm -hmm. the interplay or the, or the relationship between the artist and the community who is going to receive their work? Um, those stations were created from my home parish, and that was long before you came, or before you came to either teach here or to be a parishioner at St. Mary's, um, St. Mary's <laughs> in Arlington. Um, but that was not in consultation. I did, I was, I shared the drawings with the, the, our rector, the, the, uh, the, the head pastor of our church. Um, and he saw the work as it was emerging. And there were some people, that, uh, and I mentioned in the acknowledgements, who looked and, or posed for certain um, scenes or gave me advice. Um, and I may not be happy sometimes to get advice, but I always say thank you and then go back and say, oh, well, okay, is this right or wrong? <laughs> so there is that collaborative, but I'm not, a, I'm not, normally I'm not an artist who works collaboratively in the, in, it, but unless it's a commission and a, a, a sculpture, the, the sculpture that I did, did on the Return of the Prodigal Son, for um, Duke Divinity School was a commission. Uh, we read the, the, the parable together. We did a Bible study. I came back with, with several different models to show them. We had another discussion. So that was definitely a response to, um, I was responding to their responses, but 
interestingly, and that was a, a just a, a, the, the perfect model for a, a, um, a commission. Each time we had to make a decision, they made the decision that I hoped they would make. Um, <laughs> And so that was particularly lovely. It, it isn't always, doesn't always happen that way. Um, so, um, but I am very aware when I'm, I also do on occasion a liturgical consultation. So what does your sanctuary, does your sanctuary, for instance, reflect, does it say about your congregation what you want it to say? Because many sanctuaries, um, have been lived in and decorated uh, over decades and and a congregation doesn't realize that it doesn't really embody their interest say in social justice or it, it it says something else to someone who walks in for the first time so in a consultation um, or in a in which very often involves changes to a sanctuary it I think that it is that a collaborative process is absolutely essential and that it's no church should be split over a change in a sanctuary and you wait till everybody or, you know, as many people as possible are with you. And, and, but as far as my own work is concerned, I tend to work on it on my own in my studio. Although um, it's, I'm particularly interested in the way the creative process works and it is not, it does not work, at least in my experience, it doesn't work by having a roadmap and then I follow it. <laughs> um, it, it, is, it is definitely a, a collaboration between me and the work and the work saying, no, 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 this isn't right. And I, I say very specifically that I think this is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that if we listen to this, which we often don't want to, um, that it will be a better work than if we mm. say, no, 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 I know what I want. <laughs> I know. And so just yeah. don't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll thank so you it's for a that. kind of internal collaboration. Yeah, well, thank you for that insight into the into the process of both accounts. It's really really mm -hmm. appreciated. Uh, Kate, a question for you in your in your preachers afterward, uh, you write about that preaching is an invitation, not an exhortation. Uh, I, I just ask you if you you know expand a little bit on this because I'm sure uh, many of our listeners are going to be stepping into the pulpit very soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are, there any, uh, are there any checks you put in place to, to sort of ascertain exactly which one you're about to be doing uh, to help make sure maybe you lean more toward that invitation than, than exhortation? Mm, thank you. It's, um, it's been my experience, maybe yours and, and our listeners, of sitting under pulpits and uh, being exhorted to something that the uh, preacher feels confident in his or her life is exemplified and settled and uh, wants all of us who are hearing this to um, rise up and go do likewise. And I think that form of preaching it is likely to eventually uh, lead us into a position of um, as as the congregation of deciding whether we agree with the preacher or not and I I think preaching is not like a uh, a, a political or even a um, academic talk in advancing an argument in which the aim is to um, persuade or to um, defeat uh, other positions or to uh, encourage agreement with the speaker. I, th I think preaching is this uh, remarkable and I think unique form of address in which the preacher and the congregation stand under the word of God. 
and we likewise hear it in judgment and promise. And so it's an invitation to hear that word more clearly and to see how it, it judges and transforms us. And that I, I think is, is this a remarkable exchange between scripture and the the preached word uh, that is, I think, Joseph in that sense is uh, invitatory rather than um, paranetic and exhortative. Thank you for that. So, our final question for you both uh, concerning concerning beauty. Uh, so. Peggy, the, the, the artworks in here and the ones that people can find on your website or in the, in the book uh, about Ruth are, are beautiful, poignant, profound pieces, you know, rich in detail and uh, very moving. And, and Kate, your writing both here and in Volume 1 of your systematics is not only you know, intellectually rigorous and creative, but also uh, aesthetically beautiful. They often uh, joke to people that you make an art form of capital letters. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious uh, about, I guess, the, the place and purpose of our attention to beauty in the glorifying and worshipping of God and the guiding of Christian community. Uh, what, 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 what is it you think is, the, is lays behind or should motivate our attention to beauty uh, in these pursuits? That is a, a lovely question. And I, I can say from my part that I... I think um, to think the thought of God is the most beautiful and uh, glorious thought that human intellects were fashioned for. So I, I think theology should resonate with that. It, it should be uh, suffused with the beauty of its object. Now, I, I think that's entirely consonant with a, a clear-eyed view of sin and suffering, uh, of the, um, the concreteness of life and its particular uh, failures and fears. Um, but all of that is caught up in this light that is God's own surpassing beauty and mystery. And that's why I think theology should, should speak with a doxological voice and it should, um, should express in, in its prose as, as best as is given to us the, the honor and the, the beauty of this subject matter. Um, so that's... That's why I, I try to um, write in a, a literary way, mm. if I can, um, and to uh, elevate the divine attributes with their, their capitals, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and to, to make theology a, a work of passion, which I, I think is a, a something that the early theologians knew far better than we modern academic trained theologians know. Mm. Well, and, and there is that part in your systematic where you quote from the Song of Songs mm. about um, talking about, speaking about God should be, and then you use that wonderful language. Mm. Um, mm. I hardly know how to, follow up on what you've just said, Kate, it's <laughs> so beautiful. Um, but I do want to say thank you, Liam, for being such an attentive and sensitive reader to what we've written. Um, and I guess I would say, and this is, this is it's hard to follow uh, uh, Kate's um, um, statement there about the beauty of God, but that, Definitions of art almost often include um, the word beauty. And 
and assume that a whole set of adjectives that go with this of balance and harmony and and I think that's done a real disservice to um, um, understanding the power of art because I would say that we need a definition that includes it, there's nothing wrong with harmony and balance but also inclu includes truth in that there are images which are wrenching but of great truth and beauty in that way um, so um, but they're not beautiful in the in the conventional sense and they're not and and I'm, I'm afraid that we when we use the word beauty it's it devolves down to pretty and decorative um, and it I think it needs to be elevated mm -hmm. yeah. the, the dimension of the sublime in Peggy's work that I have always admired and I think the sublime is uh, roomy enough to include what is what is broken, what is powerful, what is wrenching mm -hmm. and evocative. As scripture does. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Folks, the book is Praying the Stations of the Cross, Finding Hope in a Weary Land. Margaret Adams Parker and Catherine Sonderegger out with Erdman's. I invite you to and encourage you to check it out. Uh, great informative chapters early on, introducing the stations, the history, their purpose, and then an actual Stations of the Cross service with the artworks, uh, prayers, and reflections, and then some beautiful afterwards from both. Uh, you cannot go wrong uh, with checking it out. I read the, the stations section just in one go in the uh, outside chapel of the Theological College uh, I attend, uh, was, was attending at the time, and uh, it was a really lovely way to spend a morning. So I encourage mm -hmm. folks to check that out. Thank, well, you. thank um, you. Thank you very much for writing the book and, 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 and producing the artworks and for coming on Love, Rinse, Repeat. Mm. Thank it you. It was wonderful. Thank you. It's a pleasure.